you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the big show. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. As always, the Chris Voss Show is the family that loves you, but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as the rest of your family. You know, you can't pick your family, but you can pick the Chris Voss Show as your family. See how that works? But just remember, just like your family, we still won't loan you money. <laughs> made that up for you for the show so there you go as always we have the most smartest people on the show refer them to refer your family friends and relatives though to the show you wanted them to be smarter that way when you talk to them over you know the coming holiday dinners you know that thanksgiving dinner and christmas dinner as assuming they still invite you the you know You'll have, they'll be smarter, and they'll be aware of what's going on. So you can invite them to the show. Go to goodreads.com forward slash Chris Foss, linkedin.com forward slash Chris Foss, Chris Foss 1, the TikTokity, Chris Foss, Facebook.com, and all those crazy places that we are, of course, on the interwebs, including Facebook, YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Facebook, I should say. We have an amazing young man on the show with us today. We're going to be talking about his hot new book. He's a multi-book author, and we're going to be talking about his book that he has coming out, August 11th, 2023. It's called Solomia, Star of Opera's Golden Age. And we're going to be talking about these insights into that. Andy Semichuk joins us on the show with us today. We'll be talking about that and some of the other work that he does. He's an immigration attorney, and we'll get into that as well and find out what he's up to when he's not writing all these amazing books. He is the author of four books. And there are, he has, let's see here, the one that we before mentioned, a Promise Kept, a Tribute to a Mother's Love, The Young Professional, A Career Guidebook for Young People, and A Treasure Chest of Humor. So there you go. He's got quite the gamut of books that are going on there. He's, he's multifaceted, as they like to say, in the educated class. He's also a current Forbes columnist, where his articles on immigration have been read by over one million readers. He's a former UN correspondent who wrote on immigration and human rights themes. He formerly wrote for the Southam newspaper chain in Canada. We love Canada. A big Rush fan there. Former Canadian public television producer for one hour public TV show in Edmonton. Edmont, Edmont, Edmonton. Clearly I'm flunking my Canadian here. A eh? <laughs> through Shaw Cable, and he's active on all the social media. Did you do any work on my favorite show, Trailer Park Boys, there in Canada? I'd like to say I did, but unfortunately, no, although I know about the program and the popularity of especially in uh, in the southern U.S. Oh, yeah. Everyone says I'm like Ricky. He currently is practicing U.S. and Canadian immigration law with the Pace Law Firm in Toronto, and he's married with two adult children. Welcome to the show. How are you, sir? Fantastic. And I love the way you started. I like the singing because that brings in the opera book that I'm going to talk oh, about. Oh, we did that just for you. I, I like the, the jokes because I got a few of those I can share with you. The there you go. That you mentioned. You do have that book of treasure chest of humor, so you better have some jokes you brought. But yeah, we did that just for you. We brought the opera just for you, Andy. We were planning on having the show several years ago when we designed that. So give us your dot coms. Where do you want people to find you on the interwebs? You can get a hold of me through pacelawfirm.com, which is mm -hmm. where I work. And Andy at myworkvisa.com is another place where you can email me. There you go. Um, so I might just mention that all my books are on Amazon if you're looking for the books. There you go. Pick them up wherever fine books are sold, ladies and gentlemen. So give us a 30,000 overview of this new book, Solomia. Okay, look, not everybody's an opera star. Not everybody likes opera. So I realize that if I'm starting with this, I've got to make it relevant to the people who are listening and to a guy like you. So how do we do that? And I think the way to do that is to mention that this book is not about opera. It's not about singing. Mm -hmm. It's about human success and reaching the top. Mm -hmm. Now, in this particular case, the person I wrote about was my great aunt, oh, wow. my grandmother's sister, and this is why I wrote about her. Mm -hmm. 
and she chose the opera world as her place to rise to the top. But it might be for other people, you know, sports, or it could be law or medicine, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. The point is, it's about the human experience and how to reach the very top of your profession or calling. And, uh, you know, to get an idea of what other people's lives are like. What I like about the book is that it's a story. It's a story. And we all relate to stories. You know, everybody's from somewhere, okay? I My background is Ukrainian. I, I'm a Canadian. I was born in Canada. We've been here for 120 years, my mm-hmm. family. But back then, my background is Ukrainian. You know, others might be, you know, Italian or Jewish or whatever the, the background. That's my background. Mm-hmm. And as a result, because it was a family member, I took an interest in her. And one of the things that intrigued me was, although she was one of the world's, she was the world's top soprano in the first decade of the 20th century in the world, and she was singing with the greatest opera stars of her age, people like Caruso, she was performing with people like Puccini and people (laughs) like Toscanini. Now, for many people... They may not know any of those names, may not know about that. But put it this way, she was, like today, a famous, shall we say, sports star or movie star or Broadway play star. She was at the top of her game back then. Mm -hmm. And although the memory of these others, the people I mentioned, Caruso, Puccini, Toscanini, remains to this day, for some reason, nobody knows about this woman. Wow. Now, is it, I don't know, you know, I, it, what intrigued me was, it, is it a feminism thing? Is it that she reached the top, but they don't want to talk about women? Or, or you know, what the heck happened? How come she's forgotten all these other people are still around? And yeah. Remember. She, she needed someone to tell her story, I think. There you go. And that's what I did, is I told her story. Now, part of her story is she ended up behind the Iron Curtain mm. as World War II started. And she never got out from behind the Iron Curtain. Mm. And so her legacy was sort of tamped out by virtue of that fact. The other people were in the West. Mm. For example, Toscanini ended up as NBC conductor in, in New York. He, you know, he was pretty famous yeah. in New York. Puccini, because of his operas, continues to have fame worldwide. Yeah. And uh, Caruso was as famous as, for example, Pavarotti was more recently for those people who follow music in that classical music opera world. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I want to talk to the people who don't know anything about opera and who don't care about opera. Those Mm -hmm. are the people I want to talk to, to tell them that there's a reason for them to take a look at this book, Solomia. Here it is here. You can Mm -hmm. see it. You wanted to say something? I was going to ask you. Now, uh, I, I see on the header here of the promo I've sent, It's uh, it, this this has to do a little bit, her story intertwines with Madame Butterfly, the opera. Thank um, you. Uh, and I was kind of curious how that played into okay. her life. For those who don't know anything about opera, Madame Butterfly is one of the top opera mm-hmm. operas of, of the world to this day. And this is the 120th anniversary of that opera's success. And the story behind that opera is worth telling. I'd like to tell it to you now. It's in the book, but I'll tell you the story. Puccini, back in the day, this is in the early 1900s, was the lead sort of composer of operas. And he was looking for a new opera, having already reached success in other operas. And one day he traveled to London and attended a play that was on in London about a Chinese, I'm sorry, about a Japanese geisha girl who fell in love with an American naval officer when the American Navy opened up Japan in the 1800s. And the story behind this love affair was that this guy named Pinkerton, who was a lieutenant in the American Navy, met Chio Chio San, this geisha girl, and they had a bit of an affair, and ultimately, they ended up having a Japanese-style wedding. And following their wedding, they lived together for a while before Pinkerton announced, hey, I have to go back to the United States. They're calling me back to the United States. But, he said, 
I will come back to be with you. And Chio Chio's son waited for him to return. She did not tell him that she was pregnant with his son. He left and was away for four or five years until he returned. By that time, the son was four or five years old. And Chio Chio's son was ecstatic that he had returned, but learned that he had brought with him in tow his American, new American wife. Mm -hmm. And so a crisis developed. The crisis is, does the little boy continue living in Japan with a geisha girl, or should he go back to the United States with Pinkerton and his new wife to lead a life in the United States? And they decide he should leave and go back to the United States. Oh. In one of the final scenes in the opera, Chio Chio san takes the boy off to the side and talks to him. And she says this to him as a parting, a, a few parting words. She says, look at this face. It is the face of your mother. Remember it. You will never see it again. Wow. And following that, the boy is left off with Pinkerton and she commits Harry Carey and dies. Oh, it's a wow. very sad ending to this opera, but it's very yeah. powerful. Yeah. So 120 years ago, Puccini, having written this opera, put it on at La Scala, the biggest opera theater in the world, number one opera theater in the world, with some great stars. A lady named Storcio, who will play the lead role, mm -hmm. a man named Gio Giovanni Genatello, who played the lead male role, and so on. To his misfortune and disappointment, the opera was whistled down and booed out. Wow. So after one performance at La Scala with some of the top stars of the world of that day, the opera failed. And the next day, all the newspapers wrote, Puccini bomb, you know, no, you know, no good. Wow. And, and he was crestfallen. Like, he, he loved this opera. But yeah. the, the audience just couldn't stand it. Isn't that amazing? Because it became yeah. so huge. Yeah. He went to his best friend, or one of his best friends at least, Toscanini, and cried on his shoulder saying, look, Arturo, I don't know what to do. This beautiful opera has been put down. What should I do? Mm -hmm. And Toscanini said, you know, there's only one lady who can help you resurrect this opera and make it worthwhile. Go see Solomia. So Mia Krushelnitska was her name, wow. who is my great aunt, and he did. And she, who was then at the top of her field, the top soprano in the first decade of the 1900s, was faced with this dilemma. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, say, Sandra Bullock being asked to play in a film that just bombed with Julia Roberts. <laughs> Do I take this on? You know, why would I? Yeah, why? They were friends. And she said, okay, I'll do it. Wow. And they started, you know, rewriting the opera and putting it on. Mm -hmm. She wore a Japanese outfit, a kimono, for two months straight every day to get herself in the role. And wow. the problem she faced was she was 30 years old, just over 30. And she mm -hmm. was playing a girl who was 15 years old, the Chio Chio San role. Oh, wow. But, and, and she, you know, the world was, the opera world at that time was in doubt. You know, could she do it? Is this thing going to make it or not? So they all clustered into this theater. It's a theater grande, Teatro Grande in mm -hmm. Brescia, which is about 60 miles from Milan, where La Scala. Mm -hmm. And in on the relevant date in 1904, they performed the opera. Wow. And unlike the La Scala performance, the audience in this case loved it from the very first act. Wow. So it was really her that made the difference then? It, it was her. Wow. At the end of the opera, the opera got seven standing ovations. Wow. Puccini was so nervous during the opera, he smoked like a chimney, he smoked like two packs of cigarettes. You know, everybody was really apprehensive. Even the audience was apprehensive. Everybody was apprehensive. But it was a great hit. And it went on from there. 
Salomia performed it 100 times before she gave the script back to Puccini and said, okay, that's it. I'm not going to perform this opera anymore. She went wow. on her operas. There you go. And it probably propelled her to higher success than she had. Is that It's fair? true. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a, a lady that performed all over the world. So she performed in Europe, South America, North America, in Africa, etc. For example, in 1928, this Solomia Krushanetska came to New York. And that was the year, by the way, that the Chrysler Building was built in New York, if you know the Chrysler Building. Oh, wow. Yeah. So she was there. That was, that was the Roaring Twenties. And as you know, Roaring Twenties jazz was the big deal. Mm -hmm. Harlem was hot, 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 hot. Duke Ellen, Ellington and all the guys were performing out there. And uh, so she came and sh she loved all kinds of music. She performed in New York, in Philadelphia, in Chicago. She even have, went up to Canada. She performed in Montreal and in Winnipeg. Now oh, in wow. 1928, going out to Winnipeg was a three-day train ride. Mm -hmm. It was the, the Wild West. Some guy came to her performance in Winnipeg from Yorkton, Saskatchewan. It took him a whole day to get down to Winnipeg. But anyway... So she, she performed there, and then she went back to, to Europe, of course. And, and now, what happened to her, and this might lead us into the other part of a, a discussion we had before we came on here. Mm -hmm. In 1939, after her, now she married an Italian guy, it was his last name. He was the mayor of a town called mm -hmm. far from Milan on the, on the coast. They lived together for 20 years. She had a very happy life, and then he died in 1936. She looked after his affairs and so on, put everything in order. And then in 1939, took a trip to Poland, to eastern Poland, just in August, just before the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was signed, mm -hmm. and just before Hitler invaded Poland to begin World War II. And she got caught behind the Iron Curtain, and she lived in, in that area of the world from 1939 all the way to 1952 when she died. But she was cut off from the West and cut off from all her colleagues. Oh, wow. And, you know, Ukraine was then under the Soviet Union, and she ended up under the Soviet Union. She died ultimately, as I say, in 1952. That's horribly unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. So the answer to the story or the questions and I hope this is not overdoing it here, is her colleagues like Toscanini and, uh, you know, all these guys, they were in the West, so they just carried on. Yeah. She could not carry on because she was cut off from them. That's unfortunate. I imagine that hurt her legacy. Yeah. You know, I mean, the behind the Iron Wall <clears throat> sadly changed a lot of lives. Yeah. So there you go. But it's great that you're... The, the, you're telling her story now so that it's getting out there. There's so many stories that were lost in history. So yeah. it was whitewashing and, and, you know, here in America, we had a lot of that going on. Did, so when you were growing up through your family, did you hear, you know, the stories passed down about her? I'll just tell you this little part. In 19, about 1957, 58, I came home as a small child for lunch from mm -hmm. school. And I'm sitting at the kitchen table in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I don't know if you know where that is, but you know, mm -hmm. North right? Yep. The, the Oilers lost to Florida, so they're all disappointed up in Canada about that. Anyway, that's hockey. They'll get over it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they will. That's true. <laughs> Next time. Next time. <laughs> I'm going to get hate mail. <laughs> anyway, I'm sitting at the kitchen table. My mother comes in with the mail. She opens the letter. She says, oh, Tata Salomia Pomerola in Ukraine, oh, which wow. is, Aunt Salomia has died. Hmm. And that was the first time I ever heard of Aunt Salomia, the opera star. Later, it took, like, my people, my family did not want to talk about World War II and what was going on over there. So it was hard to get information about her out. But over the years, after traveling to Ukraine and, and visiting there, I learned more and more about her to the point where I decided, hey, nobody out in the West knows about her. It's time to tell her story. And that's why I wrote this book. There you go. 
Now, you've written a lot of different books and uh, covered different gambits, but this is an amazing story. I mean, Madam Butterfly, I mean, can you imagine if if that had never succeeded and just gotten buried 120 years ago? Like uh, Now that you mention other books, mm -hmm. I know you're interested in le leadership. You, we were mm -hmm. talking about that earlier. Yes. Um, and just like in terms of what, what your interests are and what you wrote about, I've written a small book called The Young Professional. Oh. It's a career guidebook for young people going into the professions, and it's all about leadership. Mm -hmm. And cool. I, you know, look, I'm not God. I don't, you know, I'm not some great guy. I, you know, I just I've been working as an immigration lawyer and so on. But I have a few tri tips for young people that I picked up over the years, mm -hmm. because I've worked with thousands of young people, getting them work visas and so on. Mm -hmm. you know, the lawyers, doctors, engineers, everybody, the school teachers, the whole works. So I picked up three concerns that most people, young people in particular, but even people our age uh, have that are dominant in our lives. And the three concerns that I found very interesting were money, time, and balance. Those are the three concerns. Most people have one or two or even three of those concerns that are dominating their lives. So I wrote this book, The Young Professional, talking about those concerns and how to deal with them. And just very briefly, in terms of, in terms of, for example, money, the key there I find to be to find your unique ability and put it in the service of others. Ah. This is the way that you can best compete in the marketplace. Yeah. Why? Because it's your unique ability. Other people don't have this ability that you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, putting it in the service of others makes it affordable and worthwhile for others. In the area of time, I talk about, this is a big thing for leaders, is time. I talk about the 80-20 principle, you know, Pareto, Pareto's principle, that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. <laughs> the 20% of the people make 80% of the money. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in any anything you do, 20% of what you do gets 80% of the results. And so that's about time and how to use time. And in the case of balance, I, I talk about what are your values as a, as a leader? What are, are, are the values that you cherish? Values such as, I don't know, integrity, honesty, sincerity, you know, courage, humility, whatever your values might be. Mm -hmm. And if you ma if you can imagine like a pie chart and parts of the pie being, you know, the values that you identify. And I can't tell you your values. You know, values are values to who? To someone. Your values. So you have to identify them. But whatever mm -hmm. they are, you might say God. You might say, you know, money. You could say, you know, art or whatever it is, your values. You put it in a pie chart and then you ask yourself. How much time are you devoting to each one of these values? And if Van Gogh, who spent all his time painting and ignored everything else in his life, he was a genius when it came to painting, mm -hmm. but he was a catastrophe when it came to looking after his own life. And <laughs> his brother had to step in and help him, otherwise he would have been, you know, finished. Yeah. So, it so balance. Definitely, you got to have balance. Definitely. So let's touch a little bit before we go out on what you do as an immigration attorney. Talk to us about so you do U.S. and Canadian right. immigration lawyer. I might, I, me being in America, you being in Canada. Oh, Canada. The, the, uh, singing their your national anthem there yeah. a little bit, very badly. I think I have to say it with a lot of uh, boots, don't I? And sorries. The, so I'm working on my Canadian language. I'll skills. give you a, a story right away about Canadian. Go ahead. Okay. You know, when Canada was being formed, they were having a big debate in Parliament. What should be the name of the country? And they couldn't agree. They were, you know, just arguing left and right. And finally, Sir John A. Macdonald, the leader, called all the other leaders together in a room. He closed the door, locked the door, and he said, gentlemen, we're going to sit around this table and we're going to debate until we get a name for this new country of ours. Oh, wow. And they're debating and they still couldn't come up with a name. And then finally he said, okay, look, each one of you is going to pick a letter 
And we're going to go around the table with the letter. And from those letters, we're going to make up a name. And they did. They agreed. So the first guy said, C-A. And the second guy said, N-A. And the first one, the third one said, D-A. And that's how they came up with the name Canada. Are you serious? No, that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> C.A., you know how Canadians you talk. You got me. C.A.? Hey, yeah. okay. It, it grows on All you. All right. Take a day or two. You'll catch it tomorrow. I just, got, I just got had hard. I'll give you one other one. <laughs> a, guy, a guy goes on a boat cruise. Okay. Guys in a bar. There you go. He says to, to a guy next to him, he says, I speak three languages. The guy next to him says, what? Three? What languages do you speak? He says, I speak English. I speak French. And I speak Spanish. And the guy said, ah, say something in Spanish. And the guy says, Auf Wiedersehen. The guy says, that's not Spanish, that's German. And the guy says, in that case, I speak four languages. <laughs> <laughs> so you have some fun with it. <laughs> anyway. Oh, there you go, my friend. There you go. Anyway, you were asking about immigration. Yes, and uh, what you do there. Yeah. I'm going to introduce one little thing to you. You know, the debate right now is about the southern border. What the hell's going on there? How come so many people are coming in here? You know, how do we address this? Is that your southern border or our southern border? Yours, your, <laughs> yours, mine and yours. I'm a U.S. immigration lawyer. Like, I practiced 10 years in Los Angeles, five years in New York. I got it. I got it. It was happening to the United States. And, there you go. You know, like I get it every day and uh, mm -hmm. it's a concern of mine you know as much as it is of everybody else but here's the thing the world is a very complicated place no like, way are, are like sure? right now right now there are over 100 million people in the world who have no place to live displaced people over 100 million that's a huge sum of people and no country, not the United States, not Canada, not Germany, no country can handle 100 million people coming in. It's just impossible. So you got to worry about who's making decisions about who comes in and who doesn't. And it should be Congress. Now, Congress is not doing very well right now in terms of the immigration scene. They need to act a little bit better than they're acting. <laughs> And, and, you know, there's a hell of a debate going on in Congress and they can't agree to anything. But unfortunately, they have to agree. It's like that's what democracy is all about. you got to talk to each other and come up with something. What? we got to talk to each other? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. I don't know about um, all this. Tell, tell a man who's divorced with a woman they got to talk to each other. Wow. You know, this is, that sounds like it's pushing it here. Yeah. Anyway, this war that's going on in Ukraine... Mm -hmm. Now, that's of interest to me because I'm Ukrainian by background. Everybody's from somewhere. You know, some people are Greek, some Italian. I'm Ukrainian in background. Now, I was born in Canada. Been, my family's been in Canada for over 110 years. But before that, they came from Ukraine. This war in Ukraine, initially, when it broke out two, almost three years now ago, this is the invasion, not the real war. The war has been on for 10 years now. In Ukraine, it unsettled something like 20 million people. No, 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 not 20. 12 million people. Forgive me. Forgive me. 12 million, not 20. Mm -hmm. 20 million people. 12 million people were displaced in Ukraine, looking for some other place to settle. And of that 12 million, six million exited Ukraine and went into Western Europe. And over a hundred thousand of those came to the United States. That's just one example of things in the world that are not going very well and the displaced people and people who are uprooted and need to come to Western countries and places like the United States. It is projected that if Ukraine loses the war, that over 20 million such refugees will be exiting Ukraine, going westward, looking for places to live such as Western Europe and America, you know, Canada, Australia, etc. That's just one country. 
And that's just one part of the world and some of the difficulties that we face in terms of immigration. Now, you know, I don't have a total solution to this thing, but I do believe part of the solution is sponsorships. Hmm. After World War II, I think there was something like six or seven million people who were displaced in Western Europe. And a program was brought into being, Displaced Persons Act, I think it was called, that brought many people to the United States, including members of my family, perhaps members of family that you may know. And they came to live permanently here, but it was based on sponsorships that the people found. For example, I'll just give two examples. My aunt, Aunt Helen, came to Los Angeles in the sponsorship of Catholic Aid Society in Los Angeles. And my uncle came to the United States based on the U.S. Army help. And there were others, all kinds, millions. So I think that's one of the core things that can be done to help in terms of dealing with the inflow of people coming into the U.S. If you've got a family member or you have a profession where a professional, such as you're a teacher and there's teachers in the U.S. that want to sponsor you, or some other connection, perhaps you're, a, I don't know, a Mormon and you you got Mormons that are willing to help you, whatever it may be, I think that's a good way to bring people into the U.S. Those kind of people should be allowed, assuming they're not criminals and they're not, you know, like crazies. Most Americans are crazy, I think, so. Would be a way of bringing them in. Now, that's not going to solve the problem of 100 million people or even, you know, even close to 100 million people. But it is a way, I think it's a good way to chip away at the problem. And I think you have to have serious issues or a serious approach to getting that southern border under control. And that's stuff they're dealing with. Anyway, that's my two bits about the southern border. There you go. And so if people are interested in immigration to the U.S. or Canada for help, how can they reach you? The best way is to contact Pace Law Firm. Semichuk at pacelawfirm.com is my email address if they want to reach me that way. There you go. And your website, right? Yeah. Now, I have a personal website. It's called myworkvisa.com. And on that website, myworkvisa.com, all my books are listed there. And I talk about stuff that I do, such as what I'm doing right now here with you, Mm -hmm. Chris. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can look up stuff on me there. There you go. People like to do that and stuff. So there you go. All right. So we'll uh, give us your final thoughts in your book to help people the pitch out to pick it up and where they can get it. Okay. As far as all the books are concerned, they're all on Amazon. If you want the book about Salomia, look up Salomia, Star of Opera's Golden Age on Amazon. You'll find it. The book looks like this with a Mm -hmm. golden cover. Same is true for the other books. Just look up my name, I guess. One last thing I would like to say is, look, the war in Ukraine is ongoing now for some time. Any help and any support that people are willing to give is something that's greatly appreciated. If I may draw an analogy, if someone broke into your house and then told you, I want to live in your house, I'm going to be living here from now on. I don't think you'd be very happy about it. That's what's happening over there. So thank you for allowing me to be on your show and to share my thoughts with you and to be with you thank you for coming and our thoughts are always with the people of the ukraine we we want to see that war end and the and their lands return to them and uh, it's just devastating that in 2024 this is going on you would you would think we were over this thing and i think a lot of people thought you know we're over all the wars and and stuff but you know here we are sadly there's evil people in the world folks that's why we need to all be the best we can be and and elect the best people that we can elect that support democracy and freedom thank you very much for coming on the show sir we really appreciate it my pleasure there you go. And order of the book, folks, where refined books are sold. It was out August 11, 2023. Solo Mia, star of the opera's golden age. And, of course, you haven't checked out Madame Butterfly. It's one of the greatest operas ever. It's one of the most popular, most sung, probably, operas ever. So there you go. It's brought to you by this wonderful relative, 
of any. And now we can learn more about her and the world can know. Thanks for reminding us for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Chris Foss, one of the TikTokity, Facebook.com, Fortress Chris Foss, YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Foss. And if you want to buy me a coffee, you can go to buymeacoffee.com, Fortress Chris Foss. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.